Take your Bibles and turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, our text is Ephesians 2, verses 8, 9, and 10, though we're going to be looking at all of uh, the first 10 verses of this for our, our messages this, this, this morning. I pray that it's a blessing to you. It certainly was and has been to me as I've studied it out, as we've, we've preached the first uh, seven verses uh, on Wednesday nights, the Wednesday night and the Wednesday night previous to that. Um, had, we had one Sunday off with Brother Frank here last week, and praise the Lord, he was a blessing uh, in, in his preaching of the Word, and uh, I'm, I, I really appreciate him. And he will be coming back here uh, shortly, uh, within a few weeks, uh, but uh, I'll have to fill in for me. But uh, I just, I love the Word of God and what God's Word shows us. Let's read, we're going to go ahead and read verses 8, 9, and 10. And then we're going to uh, get into the message that the Lord has given to me. Verse 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for uh, the work of Christ in our lives. Lord, uh, I know where I'd be if, if Christ hadn't saved me. And Lord, I'm so thankful that I'm not there anymore. God, I pray that you would fill me with your spirit. And through me and myself, Lord, I pray that you would have complete control this morning. I pray that every word that comes out of my mouth would be led by the Spirit. I pray that you would fill this message with your power, Lord, and as, as uh, your word goes forth, that, that you would just touch the hearts of the people here, Lord, uh, in, in whatever way, Lord, you see that need to be. I pray, God, that you'd help us to understand this truth. I pray that, uh, Lord, that you'd help us to, to, to live it. We thank you, Father, for all you've done. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Verse 8 and 9 are a very common verse. Uh, most, most of us, uh, if you've been in church any period of time, if you grew up in church, or you've learned those verses, for by grace you are saved through faith. It's the one that we use most of the time in proving that, it's, that we're saved not by our works, uh, but by uh, the, the grace and, uh, of God and through faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, so uh, you may have quoted it, you may have it memorized, you may have it written somewhere, written down somewhere in your, in, in, in your Bible or notebook as a, to be able to use to share with somebody else. Uh, it's a good passage to, to memorize. But verse 10 says, we are his workmanship. The word workmanship there is the, 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 the Greek word Poema, it means uh, we are his creation. We are his, his craft, as, almost as in the idea of, of, a, of a piece of fabric that's been woven together or something that's been created uh, out, of, out of nothing. And, and, and think about creation, and, and, and not just creation, but uh, it, go, it goes beyond that. Uh, it, it also has the idea of a, of a masterpiece, uh, a, a painting, a canvas, uh, this uh, a craft, uh, a statue uh, pr uh, created by some great artist. And as I think back in time, uh, there are a lot of great artists. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci is one of the one of the greatest, well-known artists. Uh, I don't follow art that well, so forgive me for not knowing all the great terminology and all those things. But he was one of the greatest artists. Uh, he painted a picture uh, of a woman named Lisa. You may have heard of it. It's in the Louvre. Uh, uh, now it's I, I've honestly seen it. I think it's ugly, <laughs> but I'm not I'm not uh, somebody who really appreciates art. But if you understand it, today, even today, there will be people lined up inside the Louvre to stand there for hours and stare at this piece of at this picture, uh, this painting. Why? Because the craftsmanship and the, the work of it was, was uh, not because of the beauty of the person who sat there, but because of the craftsmanship and the, 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 the work that was done on, uh, on that painting. Leonardo da Vinci was one of the greatest painters of his time. And there were many great painters, but he was one of the, the greatest. He was, he, that was one of his masterpieces. 
The Bible tells us that we are God's workmanship. Now listen, Leonardo da Vinci was a good painter, but you know what he did? He copied what somebody else created. You can take a, a painting and, and you can sit on the beach and paint a, a beautiful sunset. Capture that moment to, in time and, and, and with great art artistry and great mastery be able to, 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 to paint that picture, that beautiful picture of the sunset and have it there for, to, to, be, to remind you all the time. Or you can just pull out your iPhone and snap or selfie, right? That's, what, that's, that's the great mastery today. You can do all that and you can just capture the beauty of that. But that was just, that's a creation of God. All you're doing is copying what God created out of nothing. God is the, great, the, the, the greatest uh, master of all times. Uh, uh, he, is the great, the, he is the creator of all things. We, we talked about, about the, how he should be lifted up and glorified because of the strength and the power of his voice and how it moved the waters. And listen, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 that he did all of those things. But the truth is, out of all the earth, out of all the universe and the beauty that's all out there, he says that we are his workmanship. The truth is, you and I, in Jesus Christ, are the greatest masterpiece that could ever, ever be found. And I thank God for what he's done for us. But to really get a good understanding of how great that masterpiece is, we need to take a look at where it came from. Because Leonardo da Vinci did not go and use mud to make the Mona Lisa. He probably got the best paints of his time and probably a very expensive uh, uh, utensils, a canvas, all those, all of those things, uh, so that it could be done well because he knew this, the, he, he desired this to be uh, a, a good painting. So he, he put a lot of effort into it. But when God found us, he didn't find the best of things. Notice in verse 8 here, it says, for by grace are you saved. The word grace means undeserved favor. It means uh, that I have not done anything to deserve the favor of God or deserve the moving of God upon my life. And, and, and we, as we look at ourselves and we compare ourselves amongst ourselves, the Bible says that we become fools. But in doing that, we, we many times lose just the, the understanding of the grace of God. And Paul here in, in Ephesians chapter 2, talking about the, the, the revolution of the Christian life from what we used to be to what we are now to what God has promised us to be someday, uh, it's just, it, it, he, he goes back in verse 1 and, and tells us exactly what we are. Verse 1 says this, and you hath he quickened. Now, uh, really quickly, if, 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 if you have a King James Version Bible, it says hath he quickened. Is that in italicized? Do you know why that's in italicized? Because it's not in, those, those verses are, are added there, and that's why they italicize it. They were added there by the translators to give you an understanding. Now, uh, he, he does talk about the, the later here in a few verses about how he's quickened, but he, what he's saying is you who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Before we get into being reminded of the fact that, 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 that we uh, have been quickened because it reminds us of where we are now, let's get back to be even beyond that. You who were dead. Well, first of all, who's he writing this to? Christians, saints. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, he, he calls them the, the church of Ephesus, the, 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 those that are, or the saints of Ephesus, the, those that are faithful. Uh, these are the, 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 the children of God, the people of God. And he says, this is who you used to be. You were dead. The word is, the Greek word is nekros. It's the same uh, uh, necrotology or there's, it's, it's, it's something that's dead. It's, it literally means corpse. Have, you, have, any, have any of you ever seen a corpse? Not necessarily human corpse. Maybe uh, the corpse of an animal. 
There's a story a, a, a preacher I heard once was giving this giving an illustration to a bunch of young people uh, uh, about how how dif- uh, disgusting sin is to God, and he talked about how he was on as a young person he went on a a youth group trip, and while they were there, there was this farmer's field right next to where they were at, and there was a dead cow in the field. The cow had been there for a while. It was bloated, swollen, his legs sticking up. Maggots were crawling in and out of its ears and nose and eyes. And he was, it was absolutely disgusting. He was, but as young teenage boys, we weren't that disgusted. So we took a stick and we were poking at the cow. Now I can see by Anita's face, she's already guessed what's happened. <laughs> but sticks are pointy. And it was blown up just like a balloon. And you know what happens when you, when you poke a balloon with something sharp? That's exactly what happened uh, to, 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 this, to this preacher. Uh, there they are. There's a group of them. They're poking the, they're poking the dead cow with a stick. And it exploded. And all the insides, all the, 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 the maggot-infested nastiness, uh, the decaying corpse of this cow that had been there for, for days was now all over them. Disgusting, right? Ah! I'm sorry, Marge. <laughs> now you and I would think that's gross. Even those teenage boys were they were vomiting and one starts and you know, one starts vomiting, then another one vomits, another one vomits. They're all vomiting everywhere. There's there's guts and inside it was just this it was absolutely repulsive. Paul says, You who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Talking about us before Christ. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were spiritually a corpse. Now, uh, we're we're alive. We're we're walking. We're talking. Say, I'm not dead. Well, you have to remember, he's talking about spiritually we've been dead. In fact, we're dead from birth. Uh, It says uh, dead dead in our trespasses and sins. That word trespass means to, 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 to fall away from the way in which you're supposed to stand. The first falling away took place in Genesis when Adam and Eve fell away from the law, what God had said, that they could eat of every tree except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they partook of that one tree. They they fell away, they they sinned. And that falling away that Romans tells us passed from him to all men, so that all have sinned. Because we were born, uh, it's it's by our character we're sinners, amen? You are born that way. There is uh, is this fallacy today in in, in today's uh, understanding that that, uh, there is is good in all men. The Bible says exactly the opposite, that there is sin in all men, that there is evilness in all men. The heart is desperately wicked. Who could know it? Uh, uh, for whereas by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so the death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Listen, yes, we have all sinned, but you, do you know why you sin? Because you're a sinner. Why does a dog bark? Because it's a dog. If you have a cat that barks, let me know. I'll bite off of you. <laughs> but uh, we, we bark be, or we sin because it's our sin nature. And so, yes, we are dead in our trespasses. Yes, we're dead in our sins. That's what God saw. He saw that mess, that nastiness, that, that abhorrent, vile, disgusting mess that we were in. It wasn't just that we were covered in it. That's, we're the dead cow in this story. And while we may mess around with dead things and think it's kind of cool, until it blows up on our face, God says, I am holy. I want, I want, would you want to be poking at that dead cow when it blew up? You would hate that, wouldn't you, March? <laughs> it wouldn't even be near it. Why? Because it's disgusting. It's repulsive. It's abhorrent. That's how God looks at our sin. That's how God looks at our sin. He abhors. He hates. It disgusts him. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3, talking about the church, people that are saved, that they were neither hot nor cold. They were lukewarm. And and Jesus said that he wanted to vomit that out of his mouth. How much more does he want to vomit our, our dead corpses? We were dead spiritually, and, and I am so thankful that we didn't stay that way, but that's where we were. And for us to understand the, the beautiful masterpiece that God has created, we need to understand what he brought us out of. 
Think back to the sin and the wickedness that, that God brought you from. You say, well, I didn't grow up in a bad home. I went to church growing up. I, I, that was me. I, 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 I swore once when I was seven years or six years old or seven years old, and that was the last time because my parents, my parents shot me very quick. Uh, if you ask them, that's the story where I swore at my cousin because I heard my uncle swear. And then uh, my dad told me he was going to spank me, and I went to bed with a, a stack of books that big in the back of my pants, thinking it would protect my bottom when, the, when punishment time came. I, I, I grew up in a good home. I didn't do any terrible, wicked things. I wasn't swearing or doing drugs or, 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 or drinking. I, mean, I had parents that loved me, that took me to church every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Anytime the days were open. In fact, I was there Monday through Friday because there was a Christian school, and I went to the Christian school. Uh, I was there all the time. I memorized scripture. I, 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 pr I prayed. I, I sang in the choir. I sang in the kids' choir. I did all kinds of things that were right. I grew up in the youth group. And, and listen, I was a good kid, but guess what God saw when he looked at me? Not my righteousness. The Bible says that our righteousness is filthy rags. There, 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 there's nothing that I can do to, to earn the, the, the love of God. There's nothing that I can do to earn the, the favor of God. There's nothing that I can do. He looks at me and says, you were born in sin. Don't get on your high horse and think where you came from makes you better than anybody else. And listen, don't, don't grow up in a, or don't have the opposite testimony and say, well, I've got a better testimony. God did more for me than he did for so-and-so. No! We were all in the same boat. We all needed the glory or the, the favor of God. We all needed his grace. Whether you were a drug addict or a drunk, into prostitution or, or into pornography, or whether, whether, you were, whether you were that good kid that everybody looked at and thought they were, they were fine, that was me. You were all, we were all, in need of something miraculous. Something miraculous. Our personal diagnosis was that we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But I want you to notice in verse 2, not only did we have a di diagnosis of being dead, I want you to notice the, the possessive dictator in our life. Wherein in times past she walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. First of all, notice he says, according to the, the, to the course of this world, the word course there, uh, it means age, it's a period of time. Uh, uh, we live in an age of sin. See, well, it's worse today than it's ever been. Yes, it is. But it's always been an age of sin. You know why? Because Satan is free to, run, to roam about and tempt people and to cause people to fall into sin. We are born sinners. We live in sin. And who's in control on this earth as, as far as God allows him to be? Uh, it, it, it's Satan. Look at today versus 50 years from that, or 50 years ago. Ain't gotten any better. Uh, 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 there's a uh, a uh, illustration. Uh, if this if this is where God is, and this is where what the picture of holiness, and this is perfectness. 50 years ago, that was where God is, and this is where the, the church was. They, they weren't holy. They, they were striving to be holy. They weren't perfect. Uh, uh, there's no way they could be perfect until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that day will be like he is, the Bible tells us. But they were doing their best. And they, they were living in this, that age of sin. And they were struggling because they were in that age of sin. Fifty years have passed. Oh, sorry. This is where the church was and the world was over here as far as standards and the way things are going. And, and we weren't as bad as the world, but and we were trying to be like God. But now what's happened? The world's gone farther over that way, haven't they? I mean, just listen to the nonsense the world's teaching you. Everything rejects what the Bible teaches. So that's where the world is now. But the church isn't over there anymore. The church is here. And we say, hey, we're, we're doing the best that we can. We're not over there. We're not, we're not as holy, but we're doing the best that we can. What's, what's going on? We're being conformed to the image of this world. What do you mean? Fifty years ago, if you had gone to the beach wearing what you, what what Christians wear now at the beach, you'd have thrown, you literally would have been thrown into jail. 
and that's by the world standards. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not here to, the, the, I'm, we're not here to talk about standards and the, those standards should be preached. I'm not here to talk about, my, what I'm saying is we live in an age of sin and we allow the world sometimes to, to convince us to go against what the word of God has to say. And it isn't getting any better. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And the church and the people of God are going farther and farther away from what God calls holy and right and just. That's what we were. You know why? Because the Bible says that's, the way that we walked. We walked according to the course of this world, but not only according to the, the age that we live in, uh, but we also walked according to the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Well, who is that prince of the power of the air? It's Satan. It is his spirit which, which, which guides and leads the children of disobedience. Uh, it is his spirit that, that causes people and dictates people that, uh, that they're under his authority. Why? Because, well, they're the servant of sin. Jesus said if you, that if you've sinned, that you're the servant of sin. Uh, uh, Colossians says it this way, that we are underneath the jurisdiction of Satan until we're saved, in which, in which time we're removed from Satan's jurisdiction, and we're placed in the jurisdiction or the authority of Jesus Christ. Never to be taken back, by the way. Praise the Lord. But, but that's where we were. We walked and did what, the, what, what Satan would have us to do. Why? Because that was our nature. The next verse tells us that we, that we did those things that were according to our flesh, this physical display according to our lust. It says, verse, uh, verse 3, among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind that were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. We lived according to our desires. Now, not, all, not every desire is bad. Not, not, not every desire is evil. But when we allow uh, the, our, our flesh to, to, to do whatever, to lead us, to guide us, to, 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 to live, we're undisciplined. We're, we're, we're going to fulfill the things of the flesh. And listen, the things of the flesh aren't good. The Bible, the Bible talks about the flesh being wicked and evil. Even our hearts are, are, are wicked and evil. The Bible says, who, who can know it? So we're, we're, we're living in an age of sin. We're dictated by the dictator of sin. We're, 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 we're uh, uh, led about by the flesh, which, which is contrary to the, to the spirit. That's what we were. And God is looking at, at, at us like Marge is looking at that dead cow. She wants to get in the car and drive. She wants me to stop talking about it is what she really wants. Uh, but but, but she, it's so, the, the thought is so sickening to her that she, she really doesn't want me to talk about it anymore. And I'm almost done, I promise. Uh, that, that's how God looks at our sin. That's how God looked at us in our sinfulness and in our wickedness. We were not fit to be used. We were not fit for anything. We, we did not deserve anything but to be buried because that's what you do with dead things. When I was 23 years old, I went to Israel, and I came back. And my dad, they were excited to see me. I was gone for two weeks. Uh, I'd been on a mission trip. My dad says, I've got some bad news for you. Um, your dog's dead. Uh, our, our dog had to be put down. She'd, got, she'd broken her hip. Uh, Katie, she was my a beagle. Smartest thing in the world, uh, as far as the dog's concerned. I've never had another dog like her. Uh, but uh, she'd gotten kicked by a mule, broke her hip, and uh, she had to be put down. But my dad had a broken back and couldn't bury her, especially in the, in the uh, frozen ground. He goes, so you've got to, you know, take care of this. So there I was, excited to be back, but burying my dog, because that's what you do with dead things. You don't stuff it unless, it, unless it's something you hunted and, and you know, mounted on the wall. But no, bury it, because that's what you do, because uh, once it warmed up, what would have happened? What was now frozen would, would, would begin to stink, would begin to swell and deteriorate and, and fall apart, and it would have been terrible to have Katie around, and that, so you bury it. But God didn't bury you and I. God didn't bury. He didn't turn away. He didn't get as far away from you. As much as he abhorred the, the, the death and the sin and the nature in which we had, God didn't do that. Look at verse 4 with me, if you would. As terrible as we were, the, uh, God said, it says this in verse 4, but God. I love the, I lo I love the, 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 the butts of the Bible because, uh, but it, it, because what it does is it erases everything that was said before. Uh, but God, uh, who was rich in mercy... 
But God, who is rich in mercy, looked at me as filthy and disgusting, as abhorrent, as revolting as I was, and he loved me! He loved me as terrible and as disgusting as I was. So, well, you're, you're trying to make us feel bad about ourselves. No, I'm trying to show you how much God loved you. That as, that as terrible as we were, as the human race is, God loved us. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But God, who is rich in mercy, his mercy is abundant. The word rich means to, to superabound. It means to, to have more than you need of something. It's, it's, it's a, if you have a basket of, uh, of food and the, the food's just falling out of the basket, you are, you are abounding in food. And that's what he's saying. God is rich in mercy. There is no amount of mercy that's too much to ask of God. There's no, there's no depths of darkness that you could ever have gone in your life that God wouldn't look at you and say, I don't have enough mercy for that. It doesn't matter where you come from. Remember, we're all, we're all equal in need of the, the grace and mercy of God, and God looks at us, and he loved us despite of us. He says here in his love, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the payment for our sin. Not only did he, did, he, did he not bury us and throw us away, cast us off, not only did he do that, but he sent his son to die and to take our sin, and he placed our sin upon Jesus Christ. That's the love of God. And when we should praise the Lord for what God has brought us from and what God has saved us from, but it isn't just about what God has done in the past and the cleaning up of, of that. It's about what he's done where we stand today and what he's got for us in the future. Because not only are we cleansed, not only are we forgiven and those things forgotten. Verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. We have here a shared life with Christ. The Bible says that we were, that we were buried with him. Raised to walk in newness of life. We, we, we use that when we're, when we're baptizing somebody. Now listen, the, the baptism again is, not a, is, is only a symbol of what's already taken place. Uh, it's a picture of what Jesus Christ did for us. But we are alive not because of us, but because of the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit. Understand this, Jesus Christ finished that work on the cross. The Holy Spirit finished that work in you. That which was born of the flesh is flesh. That which was born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not, Jesus said, that I say unto you, you must be born again. If you're saved here this morning, you have been born again. If you've never been born again, I don't care if you said a prayer, I don't care if you've been coming to this church or going to another church or, 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 or you've just been religious all your life, you must be born again. There are too many people that, are, that live in this world that, that, that will go back and say, well, I said a prayer. Back. Is there life? in you. And if there's life, there'll be evidence of that life, as we're going to talk about here in a minute. If there's no life, if there's no works, then we're only fooling ourselves. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. Paul said this, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me and the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Listen, it's it's a, it's, it's Christ who lives in us. It's that spirit that's, it, that's in us that goes against our flesh. That battle that we face all the time. Listen, it's Christ in us. So I, I can't have victory over sin. You can. Because the one who's in you is greater than he that's in the world. And the victory you have isn't because of your want to. It's not because of your desire. It's because of what Christ already did and the promise that he has made to each and every one of us. Salvation isn't just about a, a home in heaven. Well, that's part of the inheritance that we'll, that, that we'll, that we'll find. Salvation is, has more to do with the transformation that takes place in us. Jesus said in Christ that we're a new creature. Old things shall pass away. Behold, all things shall become new. 
that salvation, that new life comes because of, according to verse 5 and verse 8, God's grace. That undeserved favor. We talk about grace, that is absolutely necessary in our lives. If there is no grace, there is no life. Because we're saved by God's grace. We're saved because he looked at us and he saw us in our sinfulness and he loved us anyways. That's the grace of God. Undeserved favor. We've talked about the personal diagnosis, the dictator, the physical display, the powerful demonstration. Listen, that demonstration is of the love of God and that's found in Christ. Continuing on, verse Verse 6, we see this. And hath raised us up together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We talked about our state of sin, our state where we're standing in sin. But look at where we, we now sit with Christ. Not only did he cleanse us, not only did he redeem us, not only did he forgive us, but now uh, we, uh, the Bible says we're, we're seated together with Christ in heavenly places. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm right here, right? Uh, uh, you're sitting in that seat right there. But the Bible says that you're sitting in heavenly places if you're saved, right? Well, it's not talking about your spirit. It's not talking about your soul. Your soul is within you. You have a seat reserved for you in heaven. Uh, uh, that you have a place uh, that cannot be taken away. Uh, it's, a, it's, a safe, it's, a, it's, a, it's a seat that's been reserved by, uh, by, by the work of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit in you, and, and God took you, and through Christ, he's put you right next to Jesus at the throne. You've gone from the, the grave to the throne, and like that. God took somebody who was dead and made them alive and gave them a future. Not only are you saved, but you have now an inheritance, a home in heaven forever that cannot be taken away. Jesus said, I, I go to prepare a place for you, right? And he's talking about the, the mansions that, that, he, that he, was, he was going to go build for or, or prepare for the, the disciples and the other followers. Listen, there is a home in heaven for us and a place in heaven, and we sit there not based upon our righteousness, not based upon our good works, but based upon the grace and mercy of God and the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. But it's not just where we sit now. The best is yet to come. Verse 7 says that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Now we can look at the inheritance, the promises of the word of God, but we don't have a full understanding of what heaven's going to be like, do we? There, there are glimpses of here and there. The Bible talks about tears being wiped away. Uh, that there is no sun there. That, that God is the light. Uh, that, that, that Christ will reign forever and ever. He will be there with them. I don't know exactly what we're going to be doing. I don't have a full picture of what heaven's like. In fact, I don't have a complete picture of what I'm like. But the Bible says, or what I'll be like. But the Bible does say in a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, that that which is, uh, that, that which is uh, mortal will put on immortality. That which, is, that, that which is corruptible will put on incorruption. This is going to be changed into something that's a whole lot better. And by the way, it can be a whole lot better than this. But he's going to change it into something a whole lot better, something glorified like Christ. And the Bible says we're not going to know what that is until we see Jesus. And we'll be like him as he is. But I don't know what that's like yet, do you? So that one day we're going to fully understand just the riches of his goodness towards us and his kindness towards us where he took us from being dead in our trespasses and sins and gave us life and began to sanctify us and change us and, and mature us and prepare us. And, and one day he's going to finish that work and one day we'll be there to experience all that he has for us. The best is yet to come. But, but while it's still ahead of us, there's some things that need to be going on right now. Too many people say, well, I'm saved. I've, I've placed my faith in Jesus. Now I'm just going to wait till he gets here. That's the unprofitable servant. That's the servant that buried his talents. That's, that's, the, that's, that, that, that's, that's trusting. The Bible, or Peter said that we're to, 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 to build up or build upon, we're to add to our faith. That we're, there, there's more for us to do while we're here. 
Verse 8 says, For grace is saved through faith. And we've talked about this, that we're saved only through the faith in Jesus Christ. And that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. There is nothing that we can do other than accept the gift of God of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross for us. You cannot earn it. You cannot buy it. You cannot deserve it. You, you, you cannot want it enough. You have to place your faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. If you could do anything to it, the Bible says, not of works, lest any man should boast. God knew this, that if you could add to faith and earn your way into heaven, that he knew that in your, in your pride you would boast about it. Look at me. Didn't the Pharisees do that? Thank you, Lord, that I am not like this publican over here. I give to the poor. I do this and I do this. He did a lot of good things. Did God hear that prayer? The Bible said, Jesus asked, who went home justified? And it was not that man. It was the, the publican who beat his chest and said, Lord, forgive me. Have mercy upon me. I'm not worthy. What does God have for us today? Verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. This is really the message we've done in a few minutes. Long introduction, short message. We've seen God's revealed grace and his received gift, but there is a resulting growth. When we are saved when God begins his work in us. Philippians says it this way, that I'm confident of this very thing, which that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That work began when you placed your faith in Christ and you were reborn. But God wasn't done at that point in time. He says he had faith, confidence that God would continue that work. Verse 10 says, for we, those of us who are born again, those of us that are, that are saved, are his workmanship. We see here a, a sovereign display. Uh, uh, we are the creation. We are the workmanship of Jesus Christ, or of God. We are no longer uh, uh, dead in our trespasses and sins. We're no longer to walk in, according to the age of this world. We are no longer under the dictatorship of Satan. We are no longer filled with the spirit of disobedience. We are no longer uh, uh, run about and, and led about by our fleshly desires and lusts. God did something in us. He has given us new life. And while we still have the flesh and we still have the spirit, God says, I have created you unto good works. You are my workmanship. When the world looks at you, they, they see my work. For chapter 1 puts it this way, uh, that we're to be the praise to his glory. When, when the world looks at us, do, do, does our life and the things that we do and the things that we say point back to God? We are his workmanship. Listen, I don't know about you, but the God who created this universe, the God that created the stars, and the, have you ever seen just how beautiful the sky can be when there's no other lights around? Have you, the, the, the beauty of the sunset at times just can take your breath away. You go in to look at the, at the mountains and the, the valleys and some of these places just absolutely gorgeous and you can't imagine how God did this. That same God who did that says his greatest work is in you. What he took you from and what he's making you into. And listen, there has to be a making you into because his word promises it. And if there's no change, if there's no growth, if there's no movement towards Christ, listen, there's a problem. He's created us under good works. We are his workmanship. Notice we are his, by the way. We are a salvaged possession. We don't belong to us anymore. I am not my own. I have been purchased with a price. I've been bought with the blood of the Lamb. I belong to Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't belong to the world. They, don't have their, they, they should not have their say over me. I should not yield myself under the, the subjection of the, the world, the culture, or the social, the social things that are going on. I should yield myself to the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the God of gods. I don't belong to the world. I don't belong to myself. I don't belong to Satan. I should not be walking in those things anymore. 
I, I, those things that I used to do, there's a song. The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Is that true for you? Hopefully it is, because you don't want to do those things that please that would please Satan or that would that would that would hurt hurt the Lord or grieve with the Holy Spirit. You don't want to do those things. You should have a desire in you to do those things that would please God and bring honor and glory to his name. We don't belong to them anymore. We are a salvaged possession possession. We are a special product, and I say that because we are God's workmanship. There is no one else that can do a work in us like God. You, you, can, you can change, turn over a new leaf. I've heard that phrase. You can stop doing some of the things that you used to do. You can quit some of the things. You can go to rehab and stop doing drugs. You can go to AA and stop drinking. You can decide, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm just going to do good from now on. And you can do good. There's a lot of good people out there. There are a lot of lost people that would give you the shirt off their back and would do good, but that's all things on the outside. And really, they're still lost and without Christ. But when God changes something inside, there's a change. It's, a, it's something special. It's not I was convinced of it. God does the work and changes us and makes us more and more like Jesus Christ. How? Through the reading of the Word. That we're to dwell in Him and His, his words dwell in us. We're to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. The renewing of our mind, Romans chapter 12. Colossians, the renewing of the spirit of our mind by the washing of the water, the regeneration of the word of God. How do we, listen, don't starve yourself for the word and expect yourself to grow. You'd be an anemic, starving Christian with no root. Listen, we're not saved by our good works. Our good works are the fruit but, God's, but God and his word is the root of who we are. But if God, is our, if God and his word is the root, there will be fruit. There's a supernatural demonstration. We are created. Verse 10 again, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. There's something special about creation. You can build something out of something. But creation is to, take so to make something out of nothing. I can paint a picture. I can, I can uh, uh, well, I, I can't build anything because I'm not built that way, but there are people that can build homes and, and there are people that can work on cars. And, but what they're doing is they're using things that are around them uh, and putting it together. Only God can create. And the Bible says God took us. We were nothing. And he created what we are. We are, we are a special demonstration of God's power. And it's through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit within us. Notice the specific design. God is designing us for something. God is designing us for something were created in Christ Jesus unto good works. How many of you all have a car? What is that car for? Does it sit in your does it sit in your in your driveway as a monument to Henry Ford's uh, intelligence? No. How many of you get in it and drive it places or ride in places if you're not old enough? In Maine, it's almost it's, it's a necessity, right? So it's almost to have a have a vehicle because uh, some people we have to travel ten miles just to get to just to get to a, a grocery store. It's a long walk if we had to walk everywhere, and I don't like pedaling the bike that long. So uh, it, right, it's utilitarian. Now you can you can have a vehicle that's that's more expensive than somebody else. Uh, you could have a vehicle that's nicer than somebody else that has different things. But the, the real need for that, the, the reason it's created is for people to, to drive it around. How many of you have a dishwasher? How many of you let the dishwasher do the work? I don't, because I hate dishwashers. I'd rather di wash dishes myself and to stick them in the dishwasher. But that's just personal preference. But they were created for a purpose, right? They were created to wash dishes. 
Uh, in fact, most things uh, that, are, uh, that, that we have are created for a purpose. Uh, we, we talk about art and masterpieces. Uh, the greatest masterpieces uh, of ingenuity uh, are built for a purpose, not just to stare at. The things that are, 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 that are most beautiful uh, uh, have to do with the, 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 the one who created them and the one that's using them. Listen, uh, this is a, 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 an instrument. It was created for a purpose, uh, to play. And I, now, depending on who's playing it, uh, it can play beautiful music or eh. When I play it, it's eh. But there are people that are out there that can really play. And it boggles my mind as I watch some of these people that, uh, that, that can just take a, 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 an instrument like a, a, a we, we call it uh, ukuleles instruments, but most people think, think of them as toys. And they'll take those things and they play this absolutely gorgeous music. Like, how is that possible? Because they're a master at it. It was built with a purpose. And that, that one who is a master at it is able to take it and, and make it make beautiful music. You have been made with a purpose. God says that he has created you unto good works. The, uh, God's purpose for you is to perform good works in your life. So where does it say that other than this verse? I got a whole list of verses if you, wanna, if you really want to go there. I'll, I'll read off of some of them. You can go look at it yourself. Acts chapter 9, 36 through 39. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 9 through 10. We don't have time or else I'd read, we'd read all these. 1 Timothy chapter 6, 17 through 18. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That's where the Bible says that, we're, that the, the Bible is, will equip us for all good works. Titus chapter 2, verse 7. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Titus chapter 3, verse 8 and verse 14. Hebrews chapter 10, 24 tells us that we're to, to, push, uh, to push one another unto good works as we gather together at church. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, 12. Uh, Matthew chapter 5, 16 says that you're the light of the world. And, and that, the, 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 that this light is to shine among men, and that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God has called us to, to live a life of good works. Now, what is that? Well, a couple of those passages, and I didn't mark which ones, which is why I'm not reading them. One is Lydia. Remember Lydia? She died and everybody was there to show Paul the things that she had done for them. She was a woman known for her good works. You know what her good works were? Serving others in love. Serving others in love. Now, it's not just for women to serve others in love, though it is for women to serve others in love. The Bible said, uh, the Bible said about women how they're to be modest, uh, but with good works. It's, but men are also to... To, to, to be full of those good works. Be full of sacrificing and serving others in love. Why? Because the world around us will see it. And it will point them to Jesus Christ. When Lydia died, I believe actually it's, let's turn there real quick. I believe it's Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, verses 36. Sorry, Dorcas, not Lydia. Wrong name, right thought. Verse 36, Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days when she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And for as much as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent unto him two men, desiring him that they would not delay to come to him. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he, when he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him weeping, showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. She served others. Listen, she didn't have to be rich to serve others. She was, a, she was a, a poor widow woman, but she, she served others, and she made coats for them. She made, and the, listen, they, they loved her so much that when Peter came in, they're, they're like, look what she did for us. She made me this coat. I was cold. Isn't that what good works is? 
And James, and James, James encourages those that are rich to, to, to communicate well, give unto others as, uh, for good works. To not hold those things to ourselves. First John says it this way, that if you have uh, the ability to help someone in need, t- chapter 3, and you don't, how does the love of God dwell in you? What are we talking about? Good works. That God has ordained that each and every one of us as children of God should walk therein. I want you to look at one more verse. It's in the Titus. It's chapter 1, verse 16. Titus chapter 1. It's right after 2 Timothy. Verse 16. We'll read verse 15 and 16. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient and to every good work reprobate. If you are a child of God this morning, you are God's masterpiece. God has begun a good work in you which he will perform until the day of Jesus Christ. He has created you for the purpose that you would live a life of good works unto others. Titus there says that there are those unbelieving. They say they believe in God, but their works deny it. One question this morning. How are you living? How are you living? Because if you're saved, you've been created and made into a new creature. The Spirit of God dwells in you. The Word of God sanctifies you. And we are to be sharing the love of God to all those that are around us as we serve others in love. How are you living? Are those good works visible in your life to those that are around you? Or is your life consumed by your desires, by your career, by your wants? So those are all things that, 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 sit, that we did when we were lost. But as Christians, we're to serve one another and we're to serve the world in love. And let that be our testimony. Father God, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for this this truth, Lord. I'm so thankful that you, that you saved me and cleansed me. And Lord, I, I pray that you would just have your way here this morning. And that each and every heart, Lord, you know our needs. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment.